Now I'm going to um, look at our panel and each of them will introduce themselves to um, align how they support this uh, foundational um, rebuild as well. Is it working? Yes. <laughs> um, good evening, I'm Jill Ashton and I work for the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service. We've got three streams to the service. Um, one is our matching and placement team who help people find suitable accommodation when they have to move out for um, a repair or a rebuild and they also manage who goes in and out of the villages. So there's a village at Linwood, um, there's Rangers Park, Rafferty Domain and another one at Kaipoi. The, another part of our service is the Temporary Accommodation Assistance Program and that's a financial package that the government um, provide if people are still out of their homes when their um, insurance for temporary accommodation ceases or they've exhausted it. And the third part is the um, Earthquake Support Coordinator Service which I work for. and. Um, an earthquake support coordinator um, will go out to a person's home and listen to what their issues are and help them make a plan forward and provide information on um, anything to do with the earthquakes, the where to go, um, and they'll also um, support people at meetings. So that's us. Here we are, Michaela. Thanks, Jill. Hi there, my name's Michaela. I'm an independent advisor at the Residential Advisory Service. I'm also a lawyer at Community Law Canterbury. I've been working in this space since the earthquakes and we help people like yourselves who have uh, insurance questions who come in to get free independent advice on their policy entitlements. And at times that does involve working with the technical team which is uh, funded by MBIE and uh, people like yourselves can receive a second opinion on the insurer's repair methodology. And then based on that information, we can give you your options on whether you're receiving an as new entitlement under your policy or substantially the same under the EQC Act. I'm Victoria Wood, also from RAS. Um, we're an independent service, so we're funded by the insurers and EQC. Um, Sarah and the council, but as professional um, lawyers, we're bound by professional rules, so we are independent. I see some familiar faces here. Um, I'm William Huell. I'm working at Ambien Wellington. I've been with them for two years, working in the Canterbury recovery area, mainly involved in trying to get the Part E document out. Um, we have a goodly number of engineers involved in developing the guidance and so it is a collective wisdom exercise and we found it fairly robust and we do appreciate that it is being used widely. We're also aware that we need to keep it up to date. We had a meeting last night with a lot of the PMOs and bringing them up to speed on the latest published information. We've put out three new pieces of guidance since the last meeting with them, which was in September last year, the most notable being the 15.3 um, revision which comes out of the EQC trials and has been internationally peer-reviewed so it's a very good piece of work. Thank you. I'll ask Nathan now to um, grab the microphone and we will go row by row um, for anyone to ask any questions they might have. Please just ask the, the, the first question or the main, main major question that you have in mind. Hi, my name's Deb McIver. I had a, I'm TC3 and I had a geotech report done by an engineer company and which I asked for a copy of and, but that was done like three years ago because time's moved on, do I get a, need to get a new one based on now? Like does it change that when you're closer to rebuild you need to get another one? I think it's worth to ask your geotechnical engineer or the insurance's geotechnical engineer to check 
because over the past three, four years, the industry has been learning a lot. And for example, from a geotechnical engineering perspective, there are EQC trials. They have collected all the information. They have studied the ground better. And some of the methods being used for analysis and assessment are slightly being modified to suit the areas. So you may pay to just ask to check that it meets the latest guidance. My name's Diana Proctor, and I live in the central city, TC3. I have a small weatherboard house, less than 100 square metres. Under Southern Response, they propose to repair it. I'm concerned about the foundation uh, strategy. They suggest that up to 20% of the foundation rim, which is concrete, uh, be renewed, new altogether, with up to code, with uh, strengthened with steel rods. The rest of the house simply be filled with epoxy resin or, and um, that would be it. I had a report from an independent structural engineer and he suggested that it might be, it would be better in his opinion to simply repair the foundation rim uh, with epoxy and have it in its integrity. Believing that with the repair, it would make deeper footings anyway. So I'm left with two different possibilities. And where does this take me? We can't really um, give you an answer on your particular site because we don't know enough information about it. I don't know whether you've been to the residential advisory service with it. Yes, but I have, and I had technical advice there. It meets, um, I would say their report says that it is okay. It meets the guidelines. Right. It meets well, the building code, but they um, recommend the services of a professional surveyor to be engaged such that the correct floor and foundation elevated, elevation is established. Right. It sounds to me from the answer that they have given you that um, they feel that it might satisfy the building code but it isn't really addressing the overall performance of the house and that there is sufficient debate in the numbers to warrant bringing in a quality measurement of the floor levels. Quite a lot of the cases that come before the technical panel have measurements of floor levels which are difficult to rely on confidently and I suspect that that might be the case with yours and it would be worthwhile to get your insurer to review their levelling process. So that's what I should do, approach them to review the levelling process. Thank you very much. the guidance for engineering if the guidance for engineering judgment is not lawful what is the percentage of insurance companies that are they following your guidelines um, or are they resistant to it is there is there good is it working generally Um, so I, I, I've, I've sat on, um, I guess I've taken uh, three, three possible seats around table and in, in insurance. I've been um, working for insurers of um, 
uh, been on MD Technical Panel and we've also worked with uh, for homeowners. Um, so I've come I've come across a few of the main insurance companies, and generally it's it is it is the key um, the key tool. It's the, it's the vehicle towards to come to a repair, um, but it is recognised that that's not um, a guaranteed policy response uh, to that. So uh, in my experience personally, um, the big insurers, um, the IAG, Vero, Southern Response, um, sorry, uh, tower, tower under the IAG banner, I guess. Um, yeah, so Tower Stream. Um, I haven't as, as much work with them, but um, they do use it as well as as a vehicle to come towards a repair or rebuild uh, strategy. A difficult question. Thank you. Are there any more questions? No. Are there any more comments? You made reference to the Canterbury Geographical Database, CGD. Is public available to check that out? I, I don't think it's available to the general public. It's more to the engineers. But the same information can be found in very many different places. So the advantage it gives is collect all the information in one place. Because I believe some of those plans there, you can find them on the EQC website, but you can easily access them on the CGD. The investigations, you can look for building consent reports. You'll find the investigations for whatever property you, 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 you want, but you get access in one instant. The answer is no. But the same information can be found somewhere else. The Canterbury database, geotechnical database, is a cooperative-based process. So in order to make it work, you have to reward the people who put the information in by giving them an advantage in being able to take the information out. It is a fantastic resource that the geotech community in Canterbury have developed which really combines all the reports that have been done on property and it saves them having to redo those tests, which means that when they get the opportunity to do further tests, they can infill the gaps. And so the database has 41,000 points in it now in Canterbury. Um, you can actually get the Tonkin and Tyler ones on the web. They, they, they are actually in the public domain, the Tonkin and Tyler ones. Which is a good percentage of the database. And, and, and I think it's not, it's not a deliberate uh, kept. It's uh, a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And even as a structural engineer, 15 years experience, um, I, I wouldn't want to try and interpret some of the data in that by myself as well. So best left for a professional geotech engineer to interpret it. 